homage to my home, home state. They're a little loud. Y'all don't mess up, man. <laughs> Pressure's on. It's live. All right, well, good evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening to the Manship School of Mass Communication. Uh, my name is Martin Johnson. I'm our Associate Dean for Graduate Studies and incoming uh, Dean of the Manship School. Uh, most of you know that the intersection of media and public affairs is the signature of the Manship School, and tonight is an exemplary case of, of that emphasis here. Uh, we are so pleased to welcome this distinguished panel, uh, and uh, I am so pleased to welcome you to it. I want to thank our sponsors, uh, especially Camp Kaufman and his firm, Cornerstone Government Affairs, as well as Taylor Porter Law Firm. I want to thank uh, WAFB this evening for working with us to broadcast and live stream tonight's event, uh, and uh, recognize uh, a number of folks uh, who have made this possible. Janae Slocum, of course, the director of our Riley Center for Media and Public Affairs, and her team, uh, Jennifer Korth, Mary Chiapetta, Naeta Wilson, and Ben Cathy, uh, who are all graduate assistants for the Riley Center, and uh, the volunteer Manship School staff, faculty, and students who are helping out uh, this evening. I'll begin by introducing Camp Kaufman, who will introduce our uh, distinguished panel. Uh, Camp is the managing partner, is a managing partner for state government relations at Cornerstone Government Affairs. Uh, Camp and I were at what may have been, we're, we're, we're both students in the Manship School at the same time and, and participated in what may have been our first political communication class, uh, which relied on the expertise of national figures in politics and policy, uh, relied on them much as we do tonight. Uh, Camp serves as Cornerstone's managing partner for state government relations and brings 21 years of public affairs experience to the firm. In that role, he coordinates the firm's activities across its 10 state offices, including business development, client services, and political giving strategy. At the federal level, Camp concentrates his efforts in the areas of telecommunication, information technology, and healthcare. Prior to his work at Cornerstone, Camp worked on Capitol Hill, serving as communication director and senior policy advisor to two members of Congress from Louisiana. He has also been involved in various campaigns for Republican candidates at the local, state, and national levels, particularly in Louisiana, and he is a bachelor's alum of the Manship School, a journalism, from, a journalism degree from LSU's Manship School of Mass Communication. Welcome, Camp. Thanks everybody for being here. Uh, really appreciate um, our uh, fellow sponsors, Taylor Porter, Bob Barton, and Skip Phillips for being a part of that. Uh, thank you all for doing this. Thanks to my good friends, Ari and Mike, for, uh, for coming down to uh, Louisiana to get, uh, to talk a little bit about political communication and uh, get some good Louisiana food later this evening. So it wasn't that hard to, to convince them to come down. Um, I'm gonna uh, introduce, uh, introduce uh, the uh, students that are gonna do the interviews today um, and then, and. Um, and, and then, of course, uh, Ari and Mike. So Kayla Swanson is a senior mass communications major here. Uh, she's concentrating in public relations with a business minor. 
She is currently the Public Relations, Public Relations Director for the uh, Public Relations Student Society of America, uh, and she is the Secretary for the Association of Black Communicators. She's also the Creative Production Intern at Grow House, which is a marketing and branding company uh, with businesses who uh, affect change and promote social justice in the New Orleans area. Her career goals, and we've been talking a lot about this with students today, uh, her career goals include developing marketing strategies to give local businesses a strong community presence, and she expects to graduate in December. Thank you, Kayla, for being here. And Matt Houston is a senior broadcast journalism uh, major. He's an award-winning uh, mass comm from Tyler, Texas. He plans to pursue a career in, uh, in, in uh, broadcast journalism after graduation. He spent three years covering news and sports for student media and is an anchor and assignment editor for Tiger TV. He also covers the Louisiana State Legislature, because that's a lot of fun, <laughs> <laughs> for the Manship School. Uh, which is a university program that sends student-produced stories to major publications all across the state. So thanks, Matt, for being here as well. Thank you. Um, it's really my pleasure and honor to, uh, to in introduce my two good friends, Ari and, and, uh, and Mike, here today to talk about their unique experiences in Washington, D.C. as press secretaries uh, in the White House. Ari and I first got to know each other when I was working on Capitol Hill. He was a press secretary for a, a committee where one of the, my bosses served. Uh, we got to, got to know each other and work together on a number of great issues. He's, uh, he worked for three House members and a senator. He worked on two different presidential campaigns, Elizabeth Dole uh, and her um, um, uh, short-lived campaign, and then uh, George Bush uh, recruited him to come uh, be his spokesperson, and we know how that turned out. He ended up in the White House. Um, is one of the, uh, the smartest communicators I've ever known uh, across uh, the Beltway, as they call it in Washington. He's widely viewed as one of the most uh, successful press secretaries the White House has seen. Uh, similarly, Mike McCurry, uh, before Ari, uh, served as press secretary for President Bill Clinton. Uh, he, too, had a long career in politics and Capitol Hill before, uh, before, getting, to, um, before getting to the White House. And so uh, I'd ask everybody to, for the nice round of applause as we uh, hear the conversation today. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, this is a terrific event put on here by the Manship School. We want to thank all of you that are here in person and all of you watching at home. Uh, we want this to be conversational, informative, fun for some of you. But we also don't want to waste any of your time. So uh, let's get right on to the questions. Kayla's going to start us off. We're going to ease in now. <laughs> all right. First, uh, I'm going to start off with a little background information. Because as press secretary, you are the direct line from the president to the American people. So can you all kind of talk about um, the briefing and how y'all come up with communication strategies and how involved you are. So, I'll leave it at that. Well, would you be surprised to know that we're the, in the whole abstraction that we're in the division? Uh, it's kind of like saying, how are you going to survive when you both go through the water with sharks everywhere? Uh, <laughs> you just get through it. Uh, so much being press secretary really operates spontaneously from your heart. Thank you. 
important to understand that there's a kind of there's a division of labor inside the White House, and there's a communications office that does more of that kind of long-range planning, thinking about what is the president's message going to be at the speech next week, you know, what are the important key things to, to get across. And obviously, the press secretary tries to help deliver those messages, but we're there doing hand-to-hand combat. And what the, you know, the press board may think of as the big question of the day may not match what that carefully planned communication strategy suggested the message was supposed to be. So we are there in that place where you know sometimes you're you're getting your point across, other times you're just trying to stay alive until the end of the briefing. I um, think we've got a mic problem, so just double check. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In a job that is so spontaneous and there's a, a given a strategy that you were talking about, was there ever a time where you felt, you felt like you failed at that job? And then conversely, what did a good day look like? Mike. Well, I, the best days were the days where you really felt like you took a complicated topic and made it easier for someone to understand. I'll give you one example. When, uh, in 1995, uh, President Clinton decided to promulgate a federal regulation that would regulate uh, tobacco. And the theory of the case was that uh, nicotine is a drug and and a cigarette is actually a medical delivery device. It's kind of an interesting theory. It was later struck down by the Supreme Court. But anyhow, the, 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 uh, it was, went on like 15 pages in the Federal Register. It was very complicated. And we had the Secretary of Health and Human Services there, the Director of the Food and Drug Administration there. And they got all trapped in the weeds of trying to explain this uh, new regulation. And so I had stayed up all night long and actually read the thing. <laughs> and I got up and knocked away Donna Shalala, which is hard to do, <laughs> as you can imagine. And, uh, <clears throat> but I, I, I tried to put the, you know, this very complicated regulation into simple language that people would understand. That's the best of this job, is when you just help people who are a little bewildered about what's going on in Washington, not entirely sure, especially now these days, that they trust everything they read or hear. And if you can help them understand what is really happening at the White House, what the real work is, then you've done a good job. I, I would say, conversely, my worst days was when I, when I went out there and just hammed it up and got too political. And of course, people remember we had some interesting topics to deal with from time to time during the Clinton presidency. But uh, I think there's a great guy, uh, Britt Hume, who was at the time uh, the ABC bureau chief uh, at the White House. And is he still, he's still a fox. Oh, right? he's a fox? Yeah. Uh, he, he came to me at one point and he said, you know, you're the most political person we've ever had standing at that podium. And this is after I'd been there, you know, several months. And I, I really thought about that a lot and thought about, you know, was I being a little too snarky? Uh, was I being a little too hyper-partisan in some of the things that I was saying? And I, I dialed it back as a result of that conversation. But I think that those are the days that I felt like I missed the boat were when I kind of took my eye off the, the simple need to put factual information in front of the American people. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with my failures. Um, we'll be here a long time. <laughs> um, there's the temptation, as Mike's indicating, from the podium to get a little too cute. And that's probably what I regret. And you, you take a shot at a reporter or a shot at somebody else in public life. And it feels good from the podium for a little bit, but it doesn't have much of an afterlife. Yeah. And you, you have to be aware of how much power you have when you stand at that podium representing the President of the United States and the White House. Things that I could say on Capitol Hill about other people that nobody would raise an eyebrow about. It wouldn't even be a quote in the paper. Somebody would chuckle and laugh. You say it from that podium, boy, you just put the authority of the United States government into a quote. And so uh, there are a couple specifics. Um, I won't get into them right now, um, but they were, they were bad. Um, can I, can I tell one, one quick story along those lines? It, it involves Newt Gingrich, because Newt became Speaker of the House. And remember, we were having a lot of contests back and forth I know what on, you the, did. on the federal budget. 
And Speaker Gingrich had said something about, they were talking about entitlement reform and Social Security. And he said in, in a perfect world that uh, the need for these large social insurance programs would just wither away. And so I said, yeah, that's the problem with Speaker Gingrich. He just wants to see old people shrivel up and die. <laughs> and Speaker Gingrich was not very happy with that. <laughs> he called Bill Clinton. I remember they're in the middle of these very highly contested budget negotiations at the time. And he said, I, you and I are not going to have any further conversations on the budget unless you fire Mike McCurry. Oh, and so the president called me in and said, well, here's what Newt just said. And I said, well, well, <laughs> he said, well, what do you think I should do? <laughs> and I said, you know, like, how about sticking up for your guy here? No, so I, I called, it actually it got ironed out by Tony Blankley, a lovely guy who was uh, Gingrich's press secretary, and he and I have become friends. That's, a, by the way, a moral of the story is that people who, when they get to know each other and work together, think better things can happen. But anyhow, he rescued the job. I had to call Speaker Gingrich and apologize. And uh, it all got put back together again. And then when I left, actually, when I left the White House, because I had gotten to know uh, Speaker Gingrich a lot better at that point, he sent me this lovely crystal decanter set filled with Jack Daniels. He knew I liked Jack Daniels. <laughs> and I was just, I was so touched by that, because he was the guy who was trying to get me fired. But uh, it was Jack Daniels and arsenic. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the, you know, my, the uh, point is you can get you. You can get carried away up there and so say my, the wrong thing. I'll, I'll give you my negative story now, because uh, it involved your boss. Um, and th this is the tendency in politics, is to take the shot at the other guy. So I was asked a question by April Ryan of American Urban Radio. April is still in the White House. She's one of my favorite reporters, actually. And April um, said, isn't it true that there's so much violence in the Middle East? This was during the Second Intifada. Israel had tanks in the West Bank. You couldn't go to a restaurant in Israel without fear of getting blown up as a result of all the homicide bombings. She said, isn't it true that there's no peace in the Middle East because George Bush isn't playing an active role, unlike his predecessor, Bill Clinton, who tried to do something about it, and George Bush won't. So I took a little umbrage to the premise of the question. And I said, well, I think the case could be made since the violence began in October of 2000, when Bill Clinton was still the president, that when Bill Clinton put the status of Jerusalem on the table and tried to shoot the moon, that's what led to the violence. But April was historically inaccurate in her timetable. So halfway through my briefing, right as, well, as soon as I said that, the headline in AP was, Bush blames Clinton for Middle East violence. <laughs> so I'm finished with my briefing, and Sandy Berger, Bush's national security advisor, called Condi Rice and said, what is this? Clinton's, Bush, Bl Clinton's name. Yeah, I'm sorry, Clinton's national security advisor. Calls Condi, Bush's national security advisor, and says, what is this Bush blames? And she said, I'll take care of it. So I get a message to go see Condi after my briefing's over. So I go, oh, good, good. She liked my briefing. I'm going to see Condi. <laughs> <laughs> so I go in. Condi says, did you blame Middle East, P Middle East violence on Bill Clinton? I said, no. She said, what's this story? Did you say shoot the moon? And, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you blamed it on Clinton. I, well, well, wait a minute. <laughs> so Condi said, you have to apologize. And I said, no, I don't. Well, after about five minutes of me and Condi going back and forth, I realized, yes, I do. <laughs> so when you're press secretary and you do something wrong, you make your first stop the Oval Office. So I turned, went into the Oval, turned myself into the president, so you hear it from me before anybody else. And I had to issue a retraction and take back my words. And that was embarrassing. You get to see yourself on the network news that night. Going, In a rare moment at the White House today, <laughs> spokesman Ari Fleischer had to retract. <laughs> um, but that is my negative story. That's the failure. So on the positive side, I'll, I'll say this. I did not know this until I moved back to New York, where I'm from, after I left the White House. And you, just because of September 11th, you, you meet so many people who lost a loved one in the attack. And I've had multiple people come up to me and say that I helped them feel calm after September 11th. That wasn't intentional. It was just my briefing, what I would do. but. That, more than anything, made me feel good about what I did because it meant something to those people who were grieving. We promise we'll give shorter answers. <laughs> well, you can't interrupt me, and then we will. <laughs> so um, since we're on the topic of positive and negative decision-making, Mike, 
you were the first press secretary to host televised press briefings. How has that changed your relationship or the relationship in general with the press? Well, it, it's, a, it's something I look back with some regret now because I think <laughs> it probably has not helped matters. But the history of that is when I, when I first went to the White House, they, they had this tradition. They, they only allowed like the first minute of the briefing to be on camera. And then the rest of it was done without television or, or radio. And the broadcast guys said, you know, look, that's not fair to us because we're at a disadvantage to all the print people because we need the sound. We need the picture to report our stories. And I had come from the State Department where the briefing was televised. So I said, well, that, you know, it makes a good point. So we went, over the course of a week, we just kind of let the camera stay on longer and longer. And at the end of the week, and I never asked anyone for permission. At the end of the week, the whole thing had been on television. And uh, Mark Noller, who's a reporter for CBS, said, Mike, did you realize the entire briefing was televised today? And I said, yeah, don't make a big deal about it. And nobody did. And it was not a bad, you know, it was actually helped the reporters all was fine up until 1998 when a young lady named Monica Lewinsky came into the picture and then suddenly I was on television live every afternoon and I think in retrospect that changes the it, it changed the tempo and the flavor of those briefings because there was a lot more posturing on frankly both sides of the camera by the press and certainly by the press spokesman uh, I wish that I had put some rules and restrictions on it, saying it's fine to televise the briefing, but no live coverage, unless there's some urgent need for that. Because uh, I think that would lower the temperature and would have made it less of the theatrical event that it's become. But I, there's probably, I don't know what you think, there's probably no going back on that now. It's going to be live and on the internet and social media as long as we have those briefings. And to follow up was that, does the press secretary today have the authority to change that? Um, yes, yes and no. I mean, if, if uh, Sarah uh, Huckabee Sanders said, you know, I've decided we're not going to have televised briefings anymore, and she's, she's, I think there's been some discussion about that, uh, there would be an open rebellion by the press, and they would uh, cause a stink, and then there would be a controversy, and then one side or another would win it. But it, it is fully within the right of the press secretary in the White House to just say, we're gonna, here's how we're going to do the briefing today. And there are different settings for these briefings. Sometimes you have a senior administration official who's there, who's not briefing on the record. Sometimes uh, people will come in and it's not for camera, uh, not for sound. It's just you know a, a print only kind of briefing. So there, there are different formats that usually take into account the circumstances of who's doing the briefing and what the interest is and uh, what the real need for uh, televised briefing is. It's, it's expensive for the networks to have to staff a complete uh, you know, workup every single day with lights, cameras, and action, things like that. And a lot of those news organizations are having severe budget issues now. Right. Monica Lewinsky, you mentioned 9-11. What, how do you think you performed, Ari, starting with you during that crisis, and how do you think that role will change in today's era of constant news and social media? I thought I did great during the whole Monica Lewinsky thing. <laughs> <laughs> I just sat there and watched Mike. <laughs> um, I, I can't. Let, let's ask, how many crises did you single-handedly create? <laughs> I think I what would. time is it? Let's see. <laughs> you know, I, I can't evaluate how I did. I, I don't think that's my judgment to make. Um, you know, the interesting thing about my job, press secretary <coughs> job, is you serve two masters, but only one pays you. You work for the president. He appoints you. And I think one of the things that people have to understand about that job, that taxpayer-funded government job where you work for the president, is your job is to represent the president. Your job is not to be a neutral observer. Your job, I remember the press says to Sarah Sanders all the time, well, can't you do this? Why won't you do that? 
And the answer is because she doesn't work for the press. That's your job, reporters. And Sarah is not in their obligation to do everything the press's way. You have to find a sweet spot about being helpful to the press, getting them as much as you possibly can. But your job is not to say to the president, why on earth did you do that, and aren't you embarrassed? How could you have tweeted that? Um, but the press sort of thinks she should, which baffles me. Right. So to be a press secretary, <coughs> you've got to remember your fundamentals. Represent the boss. Articulate what the president did and why the president did it. That is what you're paid to do. And reporters have plenty of other places and sources to get additional information. Help reporters as much as you can. Steer them as straight as is possible without losing your job. But you really do serve one boss principally. I, I lean a little bit more in the direction of keeping some balance in that equation. I often make the point that the press secretary's office is really halfway between the Oval Office and the press briefing room where the briefing occurs. And I do think you have to kind of keep both sides of that equation in balance, and you have to uh, serve the interests of the press there. Because remember, they are there as surrogates for the people of the United States of America. Their job, they, they sometimes don't behave necessarily that way, but they are there, in theory, to hold accountable people who are in positions of power, to hold the president and the president's staff accountable. And they are allegedly there to report the truth to the American people about what's happening at the, at the White House. And that is a fundamental responsibility that's necessary in our democracy. When, they are, when the press is declared by the White House to be the enemy of the people, or when the belligerence in, uh, that goes into making judgments about the role of the free press comes from the mouth of the president, I think that is dangerous for our democracy, and I think showing respect, helping them. I mean, you, you Ari, you did a, a remarkably good job, particularly at some of the most difficult times post 9-11, and you, you were a calming influence on people, but you also helped the press, you know? Don't tell anybody that. We, <laughs> you did, and I mean, I've, they have told me that. They have said, look, Ari was uh, throughout that whole time. You know, remember, they were scared to death yeah. for their own safety. Yeah. And I think you help them, you help reassure them. But let me give you the example them. I'm thinking of. Two weeks ago, the president tweeted about more than one million fraudulent votes in California with no evidence. And I, to this day, haven't seen any evidence. I don't know what supports his tweet saying that. So Sarah gets asked about it. And Sarah says it's the president's view. And the press says properly to Sarah, well, how could he hold that view? What evidence is there? And Sarah said it's, it's his point of view. It's what the president believes. The tenor of that briefing to Sarah was, how on earth could you possibly let him get away with this? It's not her role to do that. It's other people's role. It's the voter's role, fundamentally. And I don't blame the press for asking the hard questions on it. But it's not for them to badger Sarah to how could he possibly do it after she two or three times just says what she says. She's given the answer. She cannot go further. Yeah, definitely. Since um, since we're talking about how President Donald Trump can now tweet directly to the American people, what exactly is the role of the press secretary nowadays? <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to explain his tweets. <laughs> um, look, the, the role of the press secretary remains essential because not everything exists on social media and Twitter. And I think the better quality conversations come from back and forth discussions, even in the contentiousness of the briefing room. So look, it doesn't bother me that President Trump tweets. He should. Absolutely. Every president we've ever known has gone around the media. You just rely on the technology of the era that you live in to go around the media. Frankly, Barack Obama was the first one to have YouTube and social media. We didn't really have it. It didn't exist. If we tried to do a government video when I was there, We'd have had our heads handed to us for producing propaganda with taxpayer dollars. YouTube comes along under President Obama when he was in office. He starts doing YouTubes. By all means, of course he should. It's how you communicate. He went around the press to get his own message out. President Trump is doing that on Twitter. I think sometimes the president can go too far and say things that hurt him on Twitter. But the, the technology and the means are immaterial to me. 
just as if the president went on Good Morning America and said something. The press secretary's job is to elaborate on it, explain it, share the president's thinking about it. And whether it's from Twitter, a statement on GMA, a meeting with congressional officials that leaked, that's the press secretary's job is to explain it and speak for the president. Yeah, I think it, you know, most reporters, if you told them that you're going to wake up every morning and the president of the United States is going to share his innermost thinking about what's on his mind that day, you would say, I've died and gone to heaven. Because that's, you know, that's the kind of access that in our White House, the press always clamored for. They wanted to have that kind of opportunity to really know exactly what the president was, uh, was thinking. I mean, the, the danger is when there's just this random ad hoc quality to it that doesn't look like it's thought out, and frankly, when some of it is just pure craziness. Uh, and that, you know, that then creates problems. It, does, it, it makes people uh, uncomfortable about what the stability is and what the president's uh, plans are, what, his, what direction is he trying to take the country. And, you know, normally a staff tries to help a president focus and make do a better job of communicating directly. I, I don't think this White House staff has got that capability because you're dealing with a president who just doesn't want to be staffed in uh, that manner. Do you know, that, that's a really interesting point, and it makes me think in many ways we've gone to a throwback presidency, the way it was Eisenhower and previous to him. Since then, the White Houses have built up these huge staffs, Mike, me, and others, all forming a barrier and a protection around the president, advice for the president, which is all well and good. But there was a time when reporters covering the White House covered the president. And staff didn't really drive stories and influence the way reporters were going to write. They covered the person who was elected. The press has that now with Trump. But they often, st they still rely on the infrastructure of the White House. So when the president does something that contradicts what the staff told them to do, the press writes, there's chaos at the White House. Well, maybe, but also, you're there to cover the president, not the staff. And I think the White House press corps is not quite figured out the roadmap to cover a guy who makes his thoughts known through Twitter the way Trump does. It's, he's authentic. He just lets it rip. It's one of the reasons he was elected. He wasn't the polished politician that everybody's come to know. And he was a breath of fresh air for many people, enough people that he was such an outsider letting it rip that they voted for him. I think the press hasn't quite caught on what that means for how they cover yeah. him. But, but the point is that might be effective in running for office politically, but is it an effective way to govern him? To he is. strategy for governing. Well, we, we'll, I guess we'll get a chance at some point to judge <laughs> how effective it is. Absolutely. <laughs> So what do you think the press could do to make better use of their time, the precious time that they have? Oh, boy. Uh, it starts here. It starts in journalism schools. That's really where you talk about the use of the press's time. I'll broaden the question. Be neutral. Learn just to be absolute neutral seekers of facts and truth and stop being analysts. Stop playing the Washington game about how did this play for this group, or how will this affect this voter population? I think there's such a clamoring for the public that's to find one place they can go to find out what happened, what the news is, with no spin and, and no analysis. And I can't recommend it anywhere where you can go just to get the absolute neutral facts anymore. I think that's where journalism is starting to lose itself. Uh, I would marry that up to the fact that I think too many reporters are liberal Democrats or I should say that, are liberals, liberal in ideology, particularly on social issues, that they kind of look as Republicans, as strange creatures who do these things. And that bias shows. Um, I have tons of examples of it. But almost every poll of the press shows that they're far, far to the left. There are hardly any conservatives in the media. And that's one of the reasons they missed the rise of Donald Trump. They just couldn't see what a lot of middle America was seeing and feeling and thinking, particularly blue-collar workers who don't make a lot of money, who are struggling for 10 years in the economy, they didn't really see that story out there. They just thought unemployment is pretty low, so times must be good. But people weren't getting pay raises, pay raises for 10 years. So that's how reporters could better spend their time, just being pure neutral seekers of fact and truth. I don't necessarily agree with everything that Arya said, but I do 
agree that getting out of the White House is something that they should do. A lot of White House reporters are stuck there in these little tiny cubicles all day long and just waiting for something to happen. Now, part of that is protective because if suddenly something does happen or there's a crisis, they need to be on the scene. But the best White House reporters, I think, are ones that get out and have sources on Capitol Hill. They go uh, move around Washington talking to interesting people who've got interesting thoughts on things, creating di different kinds of storylines, filling themselves up with more information so that they can actually do a better job of putting some of the work in the White House in, the, in, in context. Uh, so, I mean, there, there certainly should be more of that. I think I, I agree there should be a lot more attention uh, to just basic reporting of facts. I worked for Daniel Patrick Moynihan at one point in my career, and he was fond of saying everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but not to their own facts. And if we had more opportunity to just have factual information about the work of our government presented in front of us, then people could begin to sort of make up their minds. The problem now is you're told what to think about something before you even know what the subject is uh, or what the you know basics of, you know, you hear something and it's already people have got an opinion or they're on cable news spouting off about it. And I think, you know, what I would do is to see if we can't just slow things down a little bit. You know, right now, the business of journalism is based on speed, breaking news, who can get the fastest story fastest. If we kind of switched it around so it was thoroughness and substance and depth of information and that that was the hallmark, uh, that might make a difference. I, I went to college with Eric Schmidt, uh, who runs Google, and I, I joked with him one time, I said, why doesn't Google just buy the New York Times? <laughs> and strip out all the editorials and all the op-eds and just make it a purely factual presentation of information that you need. I, I, I don't remember his reaction. I think it was to the effect of, that's why I'm rich and you're not. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, th th but there is, I, I mean, it's, it's kind of what you're talking about. There is, there, there, is there a place where we all go that we couldn't say, all right, regardless of what our opinion is, regardless of what political perspective, we, uh, we all agree that this is the rock bottom place where we can, yeah. we can, we know that everything is there that we can rely upon and it's factual. I mean, that's what journalism is supposed to be in the first place. But I think you make the point, and I agree with you, that too much analysis has crept into the presentation of these facts, too much opinion. And we do need, we do need the place where we can go to just know what the truth is. What are some of the things that young journalists here at the Manship School can do to try and slow things down, Mike? Well, I mean, being thoughtful, being a little contemplative, not having to rush from one thing to another. But the point I always make, particularly to the, the younger folks out here, is spend time learning the craft of writing. Write a lot. Write more than 140 character verse on Twitter. Uh, Kiss a professor that makes you rewrite your paper for the third time. Uh, do those things because, because I, I mean, that's one of the hardest skills, frankly, to identify in young people, even those who want to come work at the White House. It's just who can write well, write quickly, and uh, really get to the essence of the story and tell it, tell it well. Mm. Uh, I, I think a real premium ought to be placed on that first and foremost. And then the, the other thing is just become literate on what are the valuable and reliable sources of information that you're going to use in your reporting? Uh, we, we call that news literacy. Where, how do I go find those sources that are going to be most uh, helpful to my readers, my consumers, and helpful to me in my job of reporting? We want to remind all of you just for a moment that we will have a question and answer session toward the end of this event, just in a few minutes. There are cards on your chairs You'll write your question down if you have one uh, on the card, and then someone will come to the end of the aisle if you'll pass it over there and pick those up uh, toward the end, and we can uh, get going with that. You're looking for some zinger. Right? <laughs> 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 well, as any gotcha questions, but, um, how do you think Facebook has played a role in the partisanship of America today? I think all social media has played a some, sometimes positive, sometimes harmful role. We tend to talk about the harm. I think there's actually a lot of good, too. But also say this. Um, one of the most influential people in my life was my grandfather. 
Uh, he was an immigrant to this country. Uh, my mother's an immigrant to this country. And he was in his 70s. He was an eye surgeon. He was in his 70s, and he was reading medical journals. And I said to him, why do you do that? Why are you still reading medical journals? And he said, because you always have to learn, and you can never change time. You just have to adjust to it. And I always thought about that. So as social media comes along, I'm not going to complain about it. I'm going to figure out how to get through it. Because I can't stop it from being here no matter what. Right. <laughs> so it's here. Um, look, I, I, I think everything in life is what you make of it and how it use it. So if you use social media to settle scores, to be really rude, to swear at people you would never talk to like that in person, that's your problem. I try to elevate the discussion, and I enjoy social media. I like the fact that I've got a few followers and I can give my opinions to anybody who happens to care about a former White House press secretary who doesn't do anything anymore. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of good that can be done with it. It empowers people who otherwise could never have a voice to have a voice. Look what happened at Starbucks just last week. Mm -hmm. If it hadn't been for that person holding that camera, chances are that would be two black men telling a story that many people might not believe. But people saw it with their own eyes because of social media. So there's a lot of good that comes with it, too. For anybody who wants to be a journalist who grow up into this business or a political communicator, you know, what I'd say about social media is use it to elevate the conversation, never to degrade the conversation. Be witty, be sharp, be smart. Don't be rude on it. And the other piece of it is don't use technology to talk to your sources. Call them. If you text somebody, you send an email to somebody, you're letting them off the hook. As a government source, nothing makes me happier than if I could get an email, and all I have to do is think about the perfect quote to send the reporter, and they'll slot it in to the story they've already written into the hole they left for my quote. And boy, I just got to say whatever I wanted. But if you talk to your source, you'll know if they're hem and hawing, if all of a sudden a break in the conversation, you better ask some follow-up questions quick. So technology can also make you a worse reporter. So take social media for the good that you can make of it and be old school, old fashioned about how you talk to people because you'll get more out of it. I, I have a Twitter account, but I rarely, Twitter, tw ra rarely tweet because I don't <laughs> have that much to say. Now, Ari does uh, do a lot of tweeting, and I follow him. And I would say I, I, you, you captured exactly the tone that you use to make interesting commentary, and some, sometimes you're even funny. <laughs> Occasionally. That's Occasionally. my staff that tweets for me if that happens. <laughs> but, but the point I would make, I made this in one of our class sessions earlier, you also are kind of a referee. And you have, you have when someone has been overly snarky, you call them out. And I think we need people who are using our social media in that fashion to really point out when some, someone's gone overboard or when th something's gotten a little out of control. We need. We need those uh, voices that will really actually put a little bit of uh, boundaries on what we're saying to each other in the new forms of social media that allow us to talk directly to each other. But I, I appreciate the fact that you do that. You two have talked a lot about the roles of press and government. What about the relationships? Mike, can you tell me about any of the relationships you formed with reporters and, and what your daily interactions with them were like? Yeah, well, I was, I had originally planned to be a newspaper reporter when I was in college, and I got, I got a job that I thought I was going to get from a paper owned by the Washington Post fell through at the last moment. I always make the point, I said, that wasn't the last time I got screwed by the Washington <laughs> Post. But uh, <coughs> anyhow, so I ended up, I ended up going into uh, politics instead, working as a press secretary, which is, as Ari and I always say, it's like, combining our love of news and our love of politics and love of people. But I think because I had initially that aspiration of working in journalism, I felt very comfortable hanging around with reporters and interacting with them and going out to dinner with them. We, uh, you know, when the president would have a fundraiser, a lot of staff liked to kind of go see all the stars and the glittery people who were at the fundraiser, I would go out to the bar with the We reporters. didn't have those people at our fundraisers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. We were, we were the Hollywood crowd. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, you'd spend time with them, and, and 
there's a lot less of that now, in my, my impression. And part of it is because reporters, and instantly when a trip is over with, with the president or if they're out on a, some kind of foreign uh, trip with the president, they all go running back to their hotel rooms to get on to Facebook, hmm. you know, hmm. to get on the internet, see what people are saying. And uh, they're missing that opportunity to develop real human relationships of trust. And I, I tell you, I got through some pretty tight spots uh, during my time as White House press secretary because the press said, okay, McCurry's getting beat up, uh, but we know at least he's trying. We know, you know, they, they wouldn't necessarily say my heart was in the right place, but they at least, they would give me some benefit of the doubt because we had worked together and had, I was, you know, it kind of goes back to the point I made about you earlier that, that you got to try to help them do their jobs. Mm. Uh, they, it, it's a profession. And that's your role as press secretary. Someone has to stick up for the press inside the White House. Lord knows there are a lot of White House staff meetings where everyone wants to complain and cry and moan about the, how bad and nasty the press is. The job of the press secretary is to go and say, well, look, you've got to understand this is how they, they see things. So at least you're, you're, you're kind of a media whisperer when, mm -hmm. when you need that kind of conversation inside the White House. Mm -hmm. Ari, do you have anything to add? I mean, did you experience that similar relationship? Yeah, Mike is 100% right on all of that. The only thing I'll add that's a little different on it is I started out really loving the press. I mean, it's what I did. I enjoyed my relations with them. But then I got worn down. Yeah. I mean, it, it does get to a point where you fly on the press charter and you go, I can't fly on the press charter. I'm flying with the president. I'm going to stay on his plane. Um, you, you, you don't want to go to dinner with him all the time. You want the mental break. Um, they can wear you down over time because it's always work standing up when you're with them. It's, it's really never off the record. Mm -hmm. And you have to be careful, especially as technology changed. Anything you say gets used, and now it gets tweeted. So yeah, that was, that was really true. We had my, my closest friends on the White House staff towards the end of my time there. Remember, when I was there, I was at the White House almost four years, which is at least another year and a half longer than what the typical duration is for a press secretary. And towards the end, I was getting pretty snarly. Yeah. <laughs> and and my, my pals at the White House said, McCurry, there are only two reporters you can go out with, Bill Plant, because he's got the biggest expense account in all of the press <laughs> corps, and will buy lots of wine. And uh, I can't remember, there was one other. But he said, but, but those are the only guys that will you know, let you be where you are right now without killing you. Ken Walsh on the day. foreign Ken trips. Walsh. Ken Walsh. That was the other one, too. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to transition now to our question and answer segment. Uh, Dr. Miller is going to come up and uh, read some of your questions from, from the audience. We're going to do something a little bit different. I'm okay. going to give three, three questions to you and three questions to you to read, so you guys can do it. Okay. That? Works for us. Is that three? Cool. Wonderful questions, by the way. Wonderful questions from the audience. Kayla, you want to start? Sure. All right. Have there been situations where you have been kept out of meetings or have had information kept from you to prevent the press from obtaining that information? Not, not me consciously. In fact, the reserve, reverse of that is true. President Clinton was very good, and Leon Panetta, who was the, our chief of staff, very good about stopping meetings sometimes and saying, you better get Mike McCurry in here because the press is going to ask him about this, and we want him to hear what the, this conversation is that's going on. Now, it, they didn't want me to come in and offer my advice or counsel or spout off my opinion, but they wanted me to be knowledgeable about all of the different things that were being argued and then ultimately to know what the president was going to decide. And we had, I mean, I, I think probably the same access you did. I had access to the president's daily brief, the National Intelligence Digest. There was nothing, nothing that I think floated around the White House that I didn't have access to. Not that I was going to use it in a briefing, say, oh, hey, you guess what's in the highly classified document? <laughs> uh, but be because it's, it's what someone forgets to tell you that gets you in trouble yeah. mm. as press secretary. It's when someone forget, you know, you, you go out and say, no, that didn't happen. And it turns out, well, actually, it did happen. And that's how some of our successors and predecessors got fried, yep. because they didn't run that extra mile to make sure that they were in the meeting, or they did kind of double check all the information they had. But, but I, I felt pretty well protected on that score within the Clinton White House. 
If very similar with the exceptions, the only meetings I did not go to were the President's in-person CIA briefing and meetings of the National Security Council. And none of the staff, other than the Chief of Staff and the National Security Advisor, would go to the CIA briefing. Um, and then none of the more political staff, so to speak, would go to the uh, NSC meetings. Yeah. So that was our structure. But otherwise, you know, the best meetings I ever went to were the summit meetings. I absolutely loved I was in all the meetings with President Putin. And so I actually got to know Putin. And when I left the White House, Putin's press secretary, um, we were on a trip to Russia. And he, he, it was news that I was leaving the White House. And he gave me, on behalf of President Putin, this beautiful blue vase, a Russian vase of some sort. And I thanked him for it. I said, is this really from President Putin? He said, it is. And so I immediately turned it over to the Secret Service for them to check it for bugs. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you really, that's what I meant about the greatest education you could ever have. You're privileged to be in a room and hear a tremendous amount, but it is the only way to do the job. Mm -hmm. This is the zinger we were looking for earlier uh, from the crowd. Ari, right, I'm going to start with you. Darn it. <laughs> How much long-term damage do you believe President Trump has created for the reputation of the free press, particularly by constantly deriding real news as fake news and conflating the two in the minds of millions? All right. First off, I never use the word fake news because I, I don't think it's appropriate. I will often call out the press when they make a mistake because I think that's appropriate. Mm -hmm. Uh, when President Trump said the press is the enemy of the people, I instantly tweeted, they're not the enemy of the people. They're people who have a hard job to do, and they often get things wrong, but they're not the enemy of the people. Having said that, I think the greatest damage to the press is damage the press is doing to themselves. I think when you look at survey after survey where faith and trust in the American people and the press is as low as it's been, right before the election, it, Trust, Gallup took a poll and it showed trust in the press to tell the news fairly, fully, and accurately. The core mission of the press was at historical all-time low. Only 32% of the American people thought the press told the news fully, fairly, and accurately. And it's very skewed. It's about 8% of Republicans think they tell it fully, fairly, accurately, about 51% of Democrats, and about 30% of independents. And I think the reason is because the press, as I talked about earlier, is, is does not represent ideologically what America looks like. And they hurt themselves because of bias. Along comes Trump, who was hostile to begin with, and he takes it to the press. And so now you have mutual hostility. Mm -hmm. And I think that's destructive. But if you're Donald Trump, on the other hand, he's got to punch his way through these things somehow. He's not a conventional establishment politician. And He's not going to roll over for things that my boss and others historically would acquiesce to. He fights back in a manner that none of us have seen before. And ultimately, we don't know how successful he'll be. But I don't think long-term damage is being done by a result of Trump. I think that trouble is more intrinsic to the quality of journalism. And that existed before Donald Trump and will exist after Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Mike? I, I agree that some of these problems pre-existed uh, Trump. I agree that some of them are the making of a press corps that I believe is often too opinionated, too cynical, uh, and not sticking with the, the sheer importance of reporting. But I think having a President of the United States on a daily basis call into question the role that independent free press plays is fundamentally corrosive to our democracy. And I think, I think he's contributed to the skepticism, to the lack of faith and confidence that many Americans have. Uh, and he's got, you know, whatever, 40% of the people who approve of the job he's doing, and a good percentage of them are going to believe what he says, even when it's, it's not right. And uh, I, it doesn't look like me. He's not going to change. He's, he's, he is what he is. Yeah, but we are, we are going to have to do some repair work on how Americans structure the conversation, get the information that they need to do their job as citizens in the aftermath of this presidency. What does that repair work look like? I mean, how can either party 
the president, the administration, and the press de-escalate the mutual hostility well, you're talking about? I mean, it, part of it is getting back to some, some real respect on both sides of that adversarial relationship, uh, getting back to professionalism on both sides, uh, you know, reporters doing the job of reporting, uh, focusing more on accuracy, paying much more attention to the need to be uh, thorough and to correct mistakes. I mean, that's a, one, one thing that I think always used to bug me, that if the press makes a mistake, they'll just run some correction the next day. Now, if you make a mistake from the podium as press secretary, they'll kill you. Right. And, that, and that's just, I mean, I, I always felt like that, that was out of balance. So, but part of that is getting the balance back to where it needs to be. And that's going to, it's going to be hard. Part of it's going to, it's going to depend on whether Donald Trump has fundamentally changed presidential communications by the way he's behaved in office and the way he's used technology and used the media. I mean, is this a new normal? And will the next president, whoever he or she is, continue to do some of the things that Trump has? Now, probably they'll continue to u they'll use, make effective use of social media. I mean, I think that's, that's not going to change. But it's the tonal quality and the vocabulary that I worry about. And I hope we get back to something that's a little but, more but respectful. But face it, there's an elephant in the room that we're not talking about, and that's the Comey investigation. Or, I'm sorry, the Mueller investigation, because so much of what's driving Trump's behavior is the notion that he thinks he's innocent, there was no collusion, yet the press makes that everything. Everything's about Russia collusion. So until we know what Robert Mueller determines, the day is coming where we're going to learn what happened or didn't happen. And if Mueller concludes there was no collusion, the press is going to have about two years of hyper coverage that was unfair to President Trump that they're going to have to live with and explain. If the press finds, if Mueller finds there was collusion, then the press is going to be vindicated in their aggressive reporting, and Donald Trump's going to be, his presidency is likely going to be over. So there's a fact we're waiting for that has so shaped the hostility of the back and forth between the press. Now, just this week, uh, there was a story, uh, Peter Stone, a very well-known investigative journalist, wrote a story from a Clatchy newspaper saying that the Justice Department has reason to believe that Michael Cohen, Trump's lawyer, actually went to the Czech Republic, as the Steele dossier said he did, and met with Russian officials. Now, nobody else in journalism has followed this McClatchy story, which is to the credit of the rest of the media. But how could McClatchy write that story? Now, if Cohen, Cohen says he was in LA with his daughter, who's right and who's wrong here? I mean, these are the things that drive this relationship, too. And I'm not going to let the press off the hook for the things they've said that fire Trump up and make him hostile, because they could be wrong too. We have to wait for Mueller. Mm -hmm. We got a little under five minutes left, so real quick for the last question, and then we'll uh, wrap up. All right. Both of you mentioned failures that were primary political, i.e., Condoleezza Rice and Newt Gingrich. Um, but have you ex experienced any moral failures? Tough one to end on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, on a regular basis. <laughs> I mean, like every day. Uh, I feel like there were, there were times when I was not, didn't live up to the standard of treating everyone fairly in the press briefing room. I had some favorites. I had some less than favorites. Uh, I don't think I treated them. I, I teach theology at a, at a Methodist seminary now. I don't think I behaved according to the golden rule at all times. Uh, you know, and I, I, I think, I think the moral failure comes from I, I don't, I, I don't believe that I ever consciously lied. I mean, I got caught one time saying, sometimes you know things that you can't tell, and you have to tell the truth slowly. That was probably not a wise thing to say, <laughs> but, uh, <coughs> but, but I don't, I don't think I ever. I think that 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 to 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 lie consciously or even to lie inadvertently inexcusable mm -hmm. in that job. And I don't think I ever failed in that sense. But I, I do think I didn't always live up to the kinds of behaviors that uh, we should expect out of people who serve the American people in that capacity. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, to me, the question is the fundamental one about do you feel good about what you did in government? Did, was there a moral failure? And to me, the answer is, is definitely no. And that's because what I've learned about government and politics and ideas is that there are two sides to everything. 
And so long as you believe fervently and uh, on a good basis for what you're doing, and you can explain it, then you're following your heart, and you're doing what you believe in. And that's why when people say taxes, ta cut taxes, does it generate revenue? Democrats will say no. Republicans will say yes. Who's right, wrong? It's, that's not a moral issue or a lying issue. I think one of the core issues that people wrestle with with the Bush years, and I certainly have asked myself these questions, is WMDs in Iraq. And I can look at everybody in the eye and say, nobody in the Bush administration ever lied. And that would go for me as well, who regularly took to that podium to say, we know Saddam has WMD. And the reason I said it was because I was told to say it because the CIA concluded it. The CIA, and just like Israel and Egypt and France, all concluded that Saddam had stockpiles of biological and chemical weapons. So we said it. We turned out to be tragically wrong. And I think people have to make a distinction in life and in everything you do between saying you're a liar, which is what everybody wants to do on social media, and saying you've got something wrong. And if the CIA hadn't concluded it, we never would have said it. Um, they gave the Clinton administration the same information, and the Clinton administration yep. had the same conclusion. Now, we went to war over it, and that's where I think people then say, but you went to war over it. But that doesn't change whether we told the truth as the CIA concluded it. Was that a moral failure? It was a factual failure. And it led to tragic circumstances, tragic developments as a result of a decision made to go to war based on information that turned out to be wrong. But I separate that again from moral failure. The, the last point I'd make, I know we're out of time, but these jobs are only as good as the person that we elect as president. Um, and I tried to remind myself every single day that no one really cares what my opinion is or no one cared what my thinking was, or you know, maybe probably didn't even care what my own moral premise was. They really want to know what about the guy that we elected president. What was going on with him? What was his decision making? And I think you need, as a press secretary, the humility to remind yourself that it's not about you at the end of the day. It's really about the president that we all elect to serve us. Well, we're out of time. But uh, let's give our guests a round of applause. He's not too bad for a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> we want to thank all of you for coming out. This is one of those events that uh, I feel like only takes place here at the Manship School at LSU. And um, we're very grateful for both of you being here and especially for you all being back here. Thank you. I'll turn back the favor to you. You guys have been wonderful, wonderful hosts. We've had a good, bunch of good things going on here. We get to go get, uh, get some good dinner from uh, Joy Lee. So we, uh, we appreciate everyone. Uh, from the school who's hosted us here as we've been here today. Thank you. And thank you to the Riley Center for putting this on as well. Yes, yeah, all the donors and students who came out and everyone that played a part in this. It was just a great event. We look forward to doing it soon. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.